Welcome everyone to Beaconsfield Podcasts. I haven't been here for a while, but it's a pleasure to be back. We're stuck in COVID in Sydney, but really lucky to be speaking today with Silvana Tomaselli. Silvana is Sir Harry Hinsley Lecturer in Lecturer in History at St. John's College in Cambridge, and she's the author of Wollstonecraft, Philosophy, Passion, and Politics. As many regular listeners not, might know, Beaconsfield is a podcast in the spirit of Edmund Burke that grapples with the question of reform in a variety of historical and contemporary contexts. But it's not often that I've taken the time to examine with a guest a critique of Burke. And so it's in that spirit today that Silvana and I will be discussing the life and ideas of Mary Wollstonecraft, a person who I think is Burke's most important and original critic. So welcome, Silvana. It's such a pleasure to have you. I'm very honoured to have this conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We might begin, Silvana, with, with a question that you posed to yourself at the start of your book, and that is why Wollstonecraft? Why did you choose to write about Mary Wollstonecraft? Well, I have been teaching and writing on Wollstonecraft for a long time, and initially I was really asked to edit her work. I came to Wollstonecraft um, in, in a way she came to me rather than I came to, to her. Um, the, I, I was asked to edit The Vindication of the Rights of Woman for a series of texts published by Cambridge University Press in the mid eighties or it might have been the early eighties then. And, um, I read the work, I read all her works and thought that we needed to include in the publication the vindication of the rights of men, which the more I read, the more important I think it is. Brief though it is, uh, it's written in a, in a great deal of rush. It's, a, it's not a very well considered work, but it has, I think, um, not only the the seed of the vindication of the rights of women, but um, I think really a very important understanding of the relationship between uh, property, family, men and women, parent and children, and um, ideas about ourselves and, and, mm. and others. And I think this text um, is undervalued, though it's appreciated more now than it was in the 20th century. So this is how I came to Wollstonecraft. Mm. Why I wanted to write a book, well, partly to collate my ideas about her, but also because it seemed to me that having been known as a feminist, it was time to place her in what I think is her proper uh, framework, uh, the way she would have seen herself. And, this is not to belittle what she wrote about the condition of women and what ought to be done about it. It's absolutely out of the question uh, for uh, me or uh, any, I think anyone else to, to do this. But it's important to remember that she thought of herself as a political commentator, as a philosopher and a moralist. And so I wanted to Put her, uh, put her forward, re, um, recalibrate her, if you wish, as a philosopher and a moralist. It, it's very interesting because part of the impetus for this show is the attempt to reform the legacy that Edmund Burke has been given by by several public thinkers over the last fifty years or so, and that is of him as the father of conservatism. When really we know that Burke was a Whig reformer. Um, a great liberal throughout his life and career. It sounds like the same thing has happened to Wollstonecraft in a different way. Is that is that correct? Do you think that's a comparison worth drawing? No, it's, it's a good comparison. I'm not sure it's we're quite there yet. Hmm. Um, I, I think be, partly because, unlike Burke, if you make a case that Burke should be seen as a reformer, you're not undermining 
book, if effectively it goes with mm. the spirit of the times, you know, nobody's going to say, oh, well, what a bore, you know, the, like Tim Bretters, <laughs> you know, staunch conservative. And so, do, do you see? So um, it's easier to make that case. Whereas mm. with Wollstonecraft, the, it is difficult, or at least perhaps not so easy to present her in a, within a different perspective, a wider perspective, without um, some people thinking that one is undermining what they deem to be her radicalism. Yes. Um, and as I said, the comparison works a bit, but it's going to take a little bit longer, it seems to me, for um, the picture to be um, readjusted, shall we say. Mm. And so what's really interesting is that the first chapter of your book, I think it's titled What She Liked and Loved. And you, you make a great effort in your book to reveal a bit or as much as we know about the inner life of the person, not necessarily the, the woman, of, of the person herself. And uh, could you give us a bit of, se of a sense about who Mary Wollstonecraft was, Silvana, and what, what meant, what mattered to her? Well, I, I don't want to be presumptuous and, and think that, you know, I got Wollstonecraft and I really know the woman. I think I know her a bit better than I used to. Mm. And what I tried to do, well, when I started the book, started writing the book, I seemed to be approaching it as I often did in my lectures and in my writing as a critic of her society, as a critic of the status of women, as a critic of uh, various uh, institutions. And so I, I like, I, sorry, I knew what she disliked, but it occurred to me that I didn't so much know what she did like. And in trying to find what she enjoyed in life, I then realized that there is a Wollstonecraft which, um, who uh, is, you know, responds to nature, who responds to music very intensely, who memorizes music, who um, has a very deep relationship to nature, loves walking, you know, a woman, you know, a woman, not just a critic, yeah. yeah. And so that's what I tried to um, to bring out. And of course, you know, it's, it's she's more attractive in this way. Not to say that um, she. It's it's just enriches our, our perspective. And I'm not the first one to make the point that she was not a kind of naysayer. Uh, uh, someone who was critical uh, about everything and, and, and everyone and had some positive uh, things to, to say about the world. But um, I wanted to emphasize that. So if we, if we come to 1790 then, which is really the event that leads to the creation of the Vindication, we've got the French Revolution going on and Burke releases his reflections. I think it's on the 1st of November um, in 1790. Wollstonecraft reacts to this book, and at the time, Burke is a, I think, 60-year-old statesman, very well respected in literary circles. He's falling away a bit from the Whigs at that point, and Wollstonecraft would be around the age of 31. There's a huge age differential there. What is Wollstonecraft's reaction to Burke's reflections, and what drives her to write A Vindication of the Rights of Man? Well, I think the age gap is in fact greater, not so much in terms of biological years, but you have to remember that Wollstonecraft doesn't have a formal education. Mm. Uh, she has not had the experience of speaking in parliament and being in the company of um, you know, the intellectual and political elite. So in, in some ways, Burke is older and she's younger than, than the years you, you mm. mentioned. Mm. Um, the main uh, reaction is that Burke was deemed to be a friend 
uh, of liberty and as the uh, free schools is now proving, so they think a champion of, of um, property. So they see him as having been a fellow traveler, as being a, a turncoat, they, they're absolutely shocked. Mm. Um, so that's one reason, but uh, Wollstonecraft is very friendly with the dissenting community and uh, um, Joseph Johnson, who uh, is her publisher, who has been a supporter uh, of her writing, has encouraged her and is helping her financially uh, in this way, um, is encouraging her to respond, not least because of the attack that Burke makes in the reflection on uh, Richard Price. Mm -hmm. So she approaches the reflection um, as a text revealing the, uh, you know, the true character of Burke and someone who has been disrespectful of a very well-considered, very respected elderly preacher. So they, they, you know, she's not the only one uh, just to be shocked by this. And then, of course, um, as she tries to defend Price, and in, in, in effect, her defense will be an attack on Burke rather than a defense of Price, she goes back to some of his writings, and in particular, the essay on the sublime and beautiful, uh, which will incense her um, for other reason, namely what he says about the, about women in it. So she, to answer your question more directly, she comes to it with more than than one sword or more than mm -hmm. one pen, more than one uh, reaction. The number there are a number of reactions: the political reaction, reaction of a of a friend, there is somebody who's Wilson Craft is showing loyalty to a community, as well as utter amazement. Yeah, from reading your book, one really gets the sense that Wollstonecraft got Burke really well, as in she was a very close reader of him. She understood his psychology and what the beliefs were informing his worldview. And, and one of the things you write is that you say, I quote, in depicting him, Burke, she depicted herself she presented herself to the world through it and asserted herself as she diminished him through that representation. How was Wollstonecraft trying to represent Burke, particularly in light of what he had said about women in The Sublime and Beautiful? And for the context of our listeners, The Sublime and Beautiful is the second text, the first major text, but the second piece of writing that Burke puts out in 1757. And it's an aesthetic treatise. It's his only work of theoretical philosophy. How does Wollstonecraft represent Burke on the basis of what he says in that book about women? Well, Wollstonecraft wants to represent Burke in relation to uh, his writings and speeches as inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to her. And inconsistency, fickleness, are associated with women. Um, she wants to represent him as passionate, passions, emotion, instability are again uh, associated with women. She wants to present him as dependent or client of important political patrons. And again, dependency is a quality associated with, or status associated with women. So you could say that one of the many prongs in her attack, and, and she's, she's completely unfair and uh, I mean, there's no holds bar. She's, it's, it's, it's visceral almost. Um, so she's emasculating him. She is showing that he is not the rational, sensible um, statesman that one might think he was. He is inconsistent in the pay of others, 
uh, bias and, and so forth. Mm. And it, it seems that in the sublime and beautiful, Burke represents the two aesthetic categories as being the first, the sublime, a thing of, of, of power, demanding respect. It's that sense one gets when they're sitting in a theatre watching a, a, a scene of murder unfold before their eyes and take gladness in the fact that it is not them within that scene, but rather observing it. It's that kind of sense of unknown power um, that demands that kind of command of attention. And that she associates that with the male as does Burke does too. And then the beautiful as Burke represents it on the other hand, you know, is about smallness. It's about softness, about fragility. And if I can just read out some of the descriptions that Burke uses of women in the sublime and beautiful, you know, he, he conjures an idea of femininity, as you say, um, an idea of beauty in women that carries with it weakness and imperfection, um, that women learn to lisp, to totter in their walk, to counterfeit weakness and even sickness. This is the, the picture, the image that, that Burke is painting of beauty and therefore indirectly of woman. Um, you said before that Wilson Craft was unfair in her critique. Do you think she was unfair to call him out on those representations? Well, I think to a degree, yes, because the way in which she uses, she quotes the passage you've just read to us, as if he, these were, that this was his idea of womanhood, was what Burke, in fairness to Burke, is saying is that this is what society associates with women or how women are associated, or this is how uh, beauty is a, a particular kind of, a particular conception of beauty is associated with women. And the way she writes is almost, she, he invented this notion. Mm. This said, Burke did write that. And mm. the, the real, uh, the point was she is fair and is where he says, and women know that this is the conception of beauty, this is what is attractive. And so they pretend to be weak and you know, uh, feeble and in need effectively of being rescued. And that is on the one hand is, um, well, of course she, she doesn't like that. On the other, if you look at her writings in the Vindication of the Rights of Woman, she herself, says that women manipulate men and of course, you know, manipulate them in any possible way, including uh, feigning weakness. So the, the relationship is really complicated. I don't think she's fair to him. They said, he did say that women manipulate uh, this idea and use it to their benefit. Now, whether that's true or not, is a, or was true or ever was true is, or is still true is, is <laughs> it's, 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 it's fascinating because after reading your book, I went back through Burke's career and tried to find every time he'd spoken or written about women. And I came down mm -hmm. to, to four points and I might just read them out because it's interesting in the context of this. The first is, are his speeches on the proposed divorce bill, which he rejects on the basis that he thinks it will fragment society and make the changes to landed property in the defense of landed property. So not a good score on that on that one. Um, the next one is the second charge of the Hastings impeachment when he's talking about the Begums of Oud. And they are Indian princesses essentially in what is now Punjab, um, mm -hmm. who were treated with gross indignity by British East India Company agents. And Burke stands up and defends, I think along with Sheridan, the honor and dignity of these people um, on the grounds of a similar reverence he shows for the Dauphiness in France, and that's the third case, um, when he starts to speak about the Dauphiness in the, in the reflections on the revolution in France as this woman of, of great beauty that causes an, a revolution in his heart. And that also includes the way that he speaks about the women of the French Revolution, as you, as you refer to on your book. You write, Burke conjured an idea of femininity defiled by the revolutionary women themselves and a violation of civilization in the vandalism of the royal bedchamber and the attack of the Queen of France, close quote. The last point that Burke speaks about women on is when he's speaking about his wife, Jane Burke. And in the sketch or a portrait that he draws of his wife, it's the only case I could find in which he doesn't speak about a woman in the way that Mary Wollstonecraft is critiquing him of doing so. He speaks of her where there's not this clear line between love and friendship. Instead, he says things of her integrity 
as if she is like a good man out just out of office, that kind of phrase. <laughs> That's a long-winded way of saying that Burke seems to have been conflicted himself in, in the way that he represented and thought about women. And I wonder what that says about his notion of constancy and integrity. You said that Wilson Craft critiques him on that ground. What is she trying to expose in Burke? Is she trying to say that he has a lack of integrity and therefore she does have a, a in full integrity as opposed to him? Um, yes, there, there isn't anything she says against him that she doesn't think will reflect well on her. Yeah. So when he's inconsistent by implication, she knows what inconsistency is and therefore what consistency would be and exemplifies it herself. She is not a dependent on anyone and she's rational. And, and, and so forth. In relation to women, of course, when she's writing the vindication of the rights of men, she is looking at his, well, two things, both of which you, you've mentioned. One, as we've already discussed, what he says about beauty and feminine beauty in the essay on the sublime and beautiful. And secondly, in the reflection, the way he speaks about the queen. Well, actually, thirdly, as you mentioned, the way he speaks about women who took to the street. Mm. Um, so there, th there is, she points to the inconsistencies there, but mm. there, the, the inconsistencies between his veneration of um, queen, Marie Antoinette and um, the, the, his disrespect, if you wish, or lack of sympathy and consideration for mm. poor women. At the back of this is the way in which uh, Burke had insisted that Queen Charlotte during the so-called madness of the king uh, be deprived of a substantial income. So there was an inconsistency there, um, which was effectively uh, easy for anyone to see. The reason why Burke was very keen that the queen uh, not be given uh, large pensions while she was residing at Bath was that Burke was very uh, worried that there'd be a second court. And of course, if you don't have money, you don't have courtiers. If you don't have courtiers, you tend to have uh, not to have power. So that was the reason. But it, it was an easy point to score that there was Queen Charlotte, model wife with all her children, etc. You contrast that to Queen Marie Antoinette, whom very unfairly people thought, you know, as this uh, extravagant. Uh, um, queen uh, and, and you know completely indifferent to the plight of the French people totally unfairly but these were the two images and yet again uh, Burke uh, if we listen to Wollstonecraft comes out as inconsistent and led by his passion this uh, sort of in, in irrational infatuation with a queen he saw very uh, quickly yeah. instead of you know, uh, rooting for, for, for the home team, so to speak, with, uh, with Charlotte, yeah. It's, it's a fascinating reversal of roles, isn't it? Because all of, all of this, these comments about relationships, men and women and who they are to each other, are really forming part of a deeper moral critique that Wilson Craft is making of the society that she thinks Burke represents. And it, one of the really interesting aspects of that is that she has a lot to say about what Burke thinks about love and respect. And I was wondering if you could tell us, Silvana, about what the difference was between Burke and Wollstonecraft, first on the notion of respect and then love. Perhaps we can start with respect. What did that mean comparatively to the two of them? Well, in it, this is quite difficult. So you're asking a very difficult question. The way I've tried to approximate an answer to that question is by calling on the kind of distinction that Immanuel Kant makes between 
respect, which he thinks involves is a kind of distance. Maybe we understand this better thanks to COVID. One always has to look for the silver lining in, in, in COVID-19. This might be one of them, understanding respect, you know, that you, you, you physically apart, respect involves um, not asking not certain questions, not you know, having set limits as to what one says, what one doesn't, what kind of um, distance as to the probing. Love, uh, in, for, for Kant, he's thinking about uh, physical love, but not just, it's not about barriers, it's about, it's the opposite. It's about undermining whatever burn, bur, um, barriers there might be between two people. Yeah. And, or more people, if you love lots of people, but you know, between people. Mm. And so you can see that if you think about it very carefully, and this is a problem not just for Wollstonecraft, Burke, or, or Kant, or anyone in the 18th century, it's something for us to think about today, mm. is that we, we want and we think people, by dint of being human, deserve respect. And that requires uh, protecting, creating barriers, if you wish, um, physical, psychological, emotional. And then at the same time, uh, we have a conception of love, which is antithetical to the idea of having limits. Yes, yes, I see. And that's really, that's, that's really interesting because there's that section in the sublime and beautiful when Burke's talking about the Greeks and the Trojans and he talks about why we admire the Greeks and we admire Achilles but we respect and love sorry we, we love the Trojans and that kind of comes into what you talked about there's this kind of distance between the heroic nature of the Greeks and then a kind of closeness breaking down of barriers that constitutes the love of the of the Trojans it's, it's interesting because Wilson Craft as you say in your book, thinks that Burke's conception of respect on that ground is antithetical to love. Is that because she thinks it denies self-respect? Is that correct? Well, the reason why she, she thinks this is to do, she would like our loved or she conceives of love uh, of human beings to be on a scale, on the same spectrum, if you wish, as our love of, of God. Mm. And so if one makes a great distinction between the kind of love that human beings feel for one another, or if one emphasizes uh, the physicality of it in such a way that really makes it difficult to see how that love has any bearing, any relation to uh, our love of the divine, then she, she thinks um, this is effectively de denies the way in which the greatest minds, the greatest philosophers conceived of love both um, this earthly and, and otherworldly love. So it has theological implications. Mm. And this would, of course, be true not just within Christianity, as she, not that she considers this, but this would be true in, in other religions. Mm. If, we then, if we then move to the picture of what she wants for humanity, so if she thinks that Burke's worldview is unequal, basically, and denies people the opportunity for self-respect and to constitute their own kind of integrity separate from what others feel about them. What is the picture of, of the relationship first between men and women that she wants to paint? What does she want? She talks about this new idea of, of woman and this new idea of man. What are those ideas and how does she hope to see them realized in society, freed from the shackles of Burke's worldview as she sees them? Well, I think she would like men and women to approximate, endeavor to approximate an ideal, which is really um, the ideal that her society has 
of men. So it's associated with masculinity. That doesn't mean to say she wants women to be like men because she thinks that men are no more like that ideal than, um, than women are. Mm. And certainly uh, no more than women are potentially. So what is that ideal concept of man? And then maybe I better say of the human. Well, it's a creature who is has developed uh, his, her reason, has developed his, her imagination, um, the, the, the skills, all of their end, end, endowment, um, mental and uh, physical. She's very keen on the development of, of the body. Physical exercise, she uh, stresses the importance of a, a healthy body for a healthy mind. It, so her view is that we should all ex approximate the and, and seek to be um, a fully realized human being. And this means an educational pro program in which different parts of, the, of one's being are developed at different times. So uh, to cut a story short, um, the imagination would be developed in all of us at an early stage and then uh, at a later stage, uh, our reason. So the, she, she, she has a view of education in which, mm. as I said, different parts of our potential are encouraged to develop at different times. This is what the ideal, so there's only one conception mm. and that is to be fully human. Um, this can only happen in a very, very different world, mm. a world in, in which we're not driven by consumption, by the desire to appear rather than to be. So it's a mm. very different world. Now, with Wollstonecraft, it's a good thing, it seems to me, to understand that she would prefer a world um, in which there had been some reforms than the nun. Mm. And so there is the reformist Wollstonecraft, you might say a kind of piecemeal effort. So if you said, well, all right, we'll, we'll keep commercial society, but we'll educate women, I, you know, is that all right mm. with you? And I think the, the response would be, yes, well, that's better than, than nothing. Do, do you see this? But it, it, yeah. that wasn't just Wollstonecraft. So she had a vision of a very different world for men and women mm. um, in which both would be parents. They might not uh, both do uh, the, the, the exact same um, kind of parenting, but they would both be uh, parents and a society in which people sought to help each other, uh, so sort of yeah. communities. Yeah, and, and part of that, I, I went back and reread the the vindication of the rights of women after reading your book and a lot of it is a case for co-education a case for mm -hmm. raising young women and young men together could you tell us a little bit about that Silvana and and what friendship and love mean in the context of that co-educational program she sets out I find it really interesting well um I think she's concerned with um, lasciviousness. She thinks that single sex institution mm. um, so, sort of uh, make you know increase sex crave, if you see what I mean. So the the more uh, children, um, the more human beings are educated together, the more the better the relation, the more balanced the relationship between the sexes will be, but it's not just between the sexes, it's also um, as members of, of one sex, because she thinks that you know, it, it, there's something unhealthy about the relationships we develop, say, between women uh, who um, are educated together or somehow um, work together. Um, and that has to do with, it goes back to respect, 
that she thinks that, and this is, she, she identifies this with the French, uh, in, in French women in particular, that they, they lack um, a kind of distance between themselves, that they're, they're effectively too open, too um, free uh, in, in the sense of not being discreet about um, their bodies and, and, and some of their thoughts. So I think she thinks it's quite important to maintain a degree of privacy uh, with other people, a degree of um, reserve, you know? Yeah, propriety, uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting because yeah. to me that vision sounds so compelling. I mean, it sounds relevant today. What scared Burke about that vision? I know he never responded to Wollstonecraft, where he did respond to pain and others. Um, but what would have scared Burke about that vision for co-education, for respectful relationships, friendship between men and women, this kind of revised understanding of that, of that in understanding itself? But in all honesty, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can only surmise, of course, he doesn't respond to the vindication of the rights of woman, I don't think he would have, in principle, objected to much of what she argued in terms of improving the condition of women. There's no reason to believe that he wanted to maintain the condition of women as it was. Mm. What, we, what is clear is that he thought that the development of chivalry over the century of uh, the, the kind of gallantry, courtesy that men showed women was indicative of the growth of civilization. So you, this was a view which was by no means uncommon, uh, often associated with Montesquieu, mm. that you could judge the level of civilization of a nation, uh, of a people, by looking at the status of its women. So for him, what happens during the French Revolution, uh, as you mentioned earlier, what uh, the way in which the queen is treated, Queen Marie Antoinette, is indicative of the unraveling of civilization as we know it. Now, if you said to Burke, look, there's another way of achieving respect for women, it needn't be that when you, I don't think it, he would have been impossible to convince, but the fact of the matter was that in Europe, this is how it had taken place. Men's uh, brutality, if you wish, had been curbed by dint of modifying, ameliorating their treatment of women. Now, whether this had led to uh, you know, ridiculous behavior and whether it's chivalry uh, had um, you know, showed excessive deference to women and, and assumed them to be weak uh, and, and in need of defense is a different matter. But mm. for Burke, you, know, you had to look at the history of how we got to um, a stage of civilization in which we were no longer what was then called barbarian. Yeah? Yeah, so yeah. Um, if to go back to co-education and taking a long way, but I am getting there. No, this is fascinating, yeah. Uh, if to go back to co-education, if this meant an overnight change in the way in which women were conceived and treated, uh, Burke would have thought, whoa, <laughs> uh, let's be careful. But that's not because he didn't want the end goal, but rather because he would have been very worried about anything. Basically, he didn't think the world was uh, perfect, society was perfect, but at the very least, this level of politeness and, and, and decency seemed to be improving. And he was very concerned of upsetting uh, the cart, you know? It's, that's really, really interesting because I've been thinking about this question a lot in the context of my own work on Burke on India, thinking about how he, how he launches that defense of the Begum's of Oud. 
And the difference is in that context is that Burke thinks that by defending women, he's defending the very mechanism of reform against the kind of revolution of the East India Company. So it's the other mm -hmm. way around to what's happening in France. And it's a it's a really wonderful point that you that you make that Burke would not necessarily have been opposed to the end. In fact, from what we know about, you know, what David Bromwich refers to as his moral imagination, it would have been very likely, I think, that had he put his mind to that issue, he might have come around and started to find ways to address it through reform. What he's worried about is the revolutionary aspect. That's would you agree with that kind of qualification? Yes, I I think that the means very much mattered to, yeah. to Berg. And, you know, you have to remember, Wilson Croft also thinks that once she's in France, she realizes that uh, yeah. whatever one thought of the Ancien Regime and its um, government, mm. um, the new lot was, was worse. <laughs> they were greedy, they were selfish, and she saw them for what they were. There was absolutely no restraint. And she was fearful for her life, which is why she passed as um, Gilbert Imlay, who, uh, uh, an American, and as a, a wife of, of an American, she would have been accorded some protection, which she was. Um, but she left, you know. So, um, she saw that the means very much mattered and that in fact, in this case, the means were also indicative of the end, mm. which is very much what the, uh, Burke's message was, uh, his own view, that there the means effectively anticipated the, the, the terror. Yeah, and, and one of the quotes that you quote from Wilson Craft in the book is, I can't remember it exactly, but it's the notion that men and women have no character at all, or most men and women have no character at all. And it seems to me that the, the thing that draws Burke and Wilson Craft together in kinship, if at all, is their concern with integrity and personal character. And they have different conceptions of what that is and how it's ameliorated or constructed or, um, or clothed based upon the context that they're in. But it really comes back down to that means point. Don't both of them think that the means essentially shape the character of the actor and they're worried about that in different ways. Yes, uh, yes, no, I, I agree with this. So the, the, it's the perspective, you know, she's young and of course it's important to remember that the vindication of the rights of men hmm. is not really a vindication of the rights of men, and it's not really a vindication of the early stages of the French Revolution. But they, the latter point has to be emphasized that they're writing in the first stages of the revolution in France. But the vindication of the rights of men is, is an attack on Burke principally. Yeah. And, uh, by extension of the things that she thinks he supports, rather than a defense of what has happened in France. Mm. And uh, certainly it's not a vindication of what's happened in France. There are a few comments which try to rectify what Burke um, is accusing the revolutionaries um, of, but it's, it's really anti-Burke more than yeah. anything else. Yeah, as, as a final question, Sylvani, you know, this, this podcast is about Edmund Burke, but I think Mary Wilsoncraft is such a compelling figure in her own right. I wonder what you think the major takeaway would have been if Burke were to have properly listened to her. What do you think he could have learned from Wilsoncraft? What did she reveal that he otherwise could not have come to? Well, that depends which of her works he would have read mm. because Wollstonecraft writes discrete works which each have a point. And of course she, in her short life, uh, she travels, she has very intense experiences and she is one of the reason why she's remarkable is that she's not 
um, afraid of revisiting her views and admitting to change. She's intellectually, I think, admirable mm. for that. This is a rare quality in someone. Um, and someone who, um, you know, professed very, very strong views, it's even more difficult to then qualify them or, or change them. So it would depend which Burke, uh, which, at which time Burke uh, responded to Wollstonecraft. At, on writing, on reading the Vindication of Rights of Men, he would have thought that it was uh, very unfair, not uh, um, really uh, very um, well-mannered uh, book by a rather uh, offensive woman. Um, the Vindication of the Rights of Women, he would have thought, uh, or again, an ill-constructed book, a patchwork of um, reviews of, of pedagogical treatises of the time, uh, repetitive, long-winded, but had quite a lot to say, as you point out, about education. He would have agreed that uh, we need to think about the way we educate men and women. We need to think about the way the, the mind develops and what is best uh, taught at which stage of an individual's life. So there, they would have had things to talk about, if not agree 100%. When it comes to her account of the origins of the French Revolution, um, he would have thought that she was beginning to see the light and she says, um, you know, that uh, there's much to be said about the English constitution and England was the land of liberty and, and, and so forth. And she, in that work, recognizes that during the uh, Ancien Regime and um, reign of Louis the Sixteenth, there were many efforts to reform and bring France's finances into some sort of uh, shape. Yeah. So again, he would have said, um, you've learned quite a bit, <laughs> well done. Um, do, do you see, so it, yeah. it, it could be that. And then when she says, you know, um, when she criticizes uh, merchants and, and says, you know, they don't smell, uh, on that, I wish I'd remember the ex exact quote, but they can't smell on their money, the, the blood uh, through which it has been Again, namely a reference to the uh, the slave trade and and, mm -hmm. and slavery, uh, and this she compares the sword, meaning the aristocracy, in former ages, and she says, you know, the sword has been merciful in comparison. So then, you know, he would have said, well, uh, yes, though of course he was not a critique, a critic, sorry, of of commerce. I think think to the way mm. um to, to the extent that, that that she is and if anything he could have learned from the fact that she was able to change her views but didn't tend to change his views or acknowledge that he did <laughs> um very yeah. much yes i th think i mean she doesn't change it in the sense that sh she You know, she's she's not a turncoat herself. Do, do you mm. see this? But yeah. what what's good is that she learns from from experience. And of mm. course, you know, as you said at the beginning, he's much older than her, and she's going to. They both live to extraordinary time, and they both learn from extraordinary times. They learn some of the same things, but at slightly different moments. Yeah, and they die in the same year, 1797, which is very sad yes. because Burke gets yeah. a full life and, and Mary Wollstonecraft does not. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, but thank you so much, Silvana. This has really been such a wonderful, fascinating conversation because I, I, I am so interested in what Burke has to say, particularly about relationships, love and respect. And to have him in conversation with Mary Wollstonecraft, who, as I said at the start, I take to be his most interesting original and... Uh, and and meaningful critic um, has it's been a wonderful honor to be able to explore that with you in conversation so thank you so much
Well, thank you very much. It's very yeah. nice for me to speak about her with someone um, so knowledgeable about <laughs> Burke and her. So it's <laughs> thank you. a pleasure. Thank you so much.